Thank you. And I'm, I'm very glad to have been um, invited to give this, this talk, this inspirational talk. Uh, and the title is Causes and Consequences of Childhood Disorders from Genes to Teens in Twin and Kin. And I'm going to talk for about half an hour and you're more than welcome to ask me questions. Um, I'd like to start with, with my own inspiration. Um, this is supposed to be, you, you're supposed to be inspired by a professor, but I also want to tell you about my own inspiration. And I'm going to do it, take you through the, the presentation in these five items. First of all, I'm going to talk about clinical research questions. I'm going to talk about interaction with patients and parents, and also translation research, such as clinics, epidemiology and public health, genes, envi genes and environment, and biomarkers, biostatistics and bioinformatics. And also a little bit about teaching and supervision and knowledge transition. Uh, first of all, two words about myself. I'm a, I'm a clinical researcher and a clinician. I'm a pediatrician uh, and I work at Astrid Lingen Children's Hospital uh, approximately 30% of my time. I did my PhD thesis in 2002 on a book called Cats and Dogs Allergens, Dispersion, Exposure and Healthy Effects in Childhood. And this made me very inspired to do epidemiological research and to do research on causes and consequences of asthma and allergic disease. So after the thesis, I had an opportunity to go to Sydney for a couple of years to do a, a postdoc, and there I learned new methods that I could then take back into the clinics and into, into KI when I came back. Uh, and since then, I've been working part-time in research and part-time in clinics. Uh, I've now developed a research group with uh, medical students, MDs, PhD students, postdocs, and a lot of collaboration. I'm very proud to have a couple of them here today as well. Uh, one of the things there is to develop a, a, a group with people that have different skills and methodology and know different things different from, you, you from yourself. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So to start with, my, my own inspiration has come very much from clinical, clinical research questions in, in, the, uh, in the contact with, with parents and patients. So um, in pediatrics, we work with children between 0 and 18 years of age. So it's a very wide age span, and they've got very different diseases. Um, one of the diseases that I work with a lot is asthma and obstructive bronchitis, uh, and as well as allergic disease. But there are also uh, lots of respiratory and urinary tract infections, diabetes, neuropsychiatric disorders, etc. And we work a lot on diagnosis and treatment in and outpatient clinics, whether they should be admitted to hospital, if we give medication or not, and then follow up. And uh, in that process, uh, we also give a lot of advice, a lot of uh, work. We lo work a lot with, with the parents, of course. We give advice, uh, and we talk a lot, and they wonder often about causes and consequences. Now, why did my child get asthma? What is the consequence of asthma? What is the consequence of this medication? Um, what is the comorbidity? Are there risks of other diseases if you have asthma, etc.? And that's the kind of questions that we, that we try to answer also. I take that back into my research and try to answer them. Um, some of the uh, questions are often about environment. Is there anything I can do to avoid asthma and allergic disease in my child? Um, does birth weight matter, antibiotics, cats and dogs, tobacco smoking, motor delivery and all other things. Uh, and also genes and family history is a big issue. Um, are there genetic or epigenetic um, re uh, reasons for a disease? So we work also uh, with, with um, large population based registers. We work with birth cohorts and we work with twins. So just a few words about what asthma is to start with. Uh, asthma is, is a, a common disorder. It's about a prevalence of about 68% in school children. Characteristics are wheezing and shortness of breath, cough, cough and mucus production. But also exacerbations. Um, they get, you get exacerbations with respiratory tract infections during allergies, pollen season, pollen pets, etc., and from exercise. It's also a, an it's a, a disease that goes with both inflammation and obstruction. So this is the normal uh, airway, and this is the inflamed airway. We can see that it's very uh, a, a large obstruction in the, in the fluid, of, in the uh, airway fluid. So treatment is to treat both the obstruction and treat that with bronchodilators and beta agonists, and also treat the inflammation. 
often with inhaled corticosteroids or with a combination of long-acting beta agonists and intra in, in, inhaled uh, corticosteroids, but also antileukotrienes. This is in a child, it's difficult for them to inhale the medication, so we often give it in dif with different devices so that it's easy for them to get. And they often, you can see that they really, really like the medication. They really get sort of, they like to have the medication. Uh, this is the device that we use. And in older children and in adults, we can use um, the, the other type of, of inhalers that are available. So, um, so there has also been an increase in the prevalence of asthma in recent decades, uh, in the approximately last 40 or 50 years. And this is something that has been both an increase in asthma and allergic disease. Uh, it has plateaued, so it's not increasing anymore in Sweden and in other sort of northern European countries, but it's still increasing in other, in other countries, especially uh, countries that are currently being westernized. Uh, so, there is a, a, so there is something probably in the environment. So a lot of focus has been on the environment um, for the reasons why the, there is an increase in, in the prevalence of asthma. So, uh, so how do we study the risk factors for asthma? Well, it's, there are, of course, different ways, but we have focused very much on, on the ab ability to follow a newborn or a, a, a group of newborns prospectively. We follow them from birth. We measure exposures or risk factors early on, either, the qu either through questionnaires where we ask the parents, does your child have da-da-da, or in the, in the registers. We, we get data from the medical birth register, for example, data on gestational age and birth weight and other, other, other things. And then we follow them over time and we measure an outcome, a disease, later on. And the disease here is asthma, but of course there are lots of other, other diseases as well. Um, and then we assess the association between exposure and risk factor. We can also take confounders into account, confounders that can affect both exposure and the risk of and the asthma, for example, tobacco smoke, uh, um, diet and other, other things. We call that confounders. So, uh, so, so I'd like to give one example on the way that we do a register-based, population-based study. I'm also going to give two examples later on, on birth cohorts and twin studies. Um, but this is, this is a, a study, a, a question we often get from the parents is, if I give my child antibiotics, what is the risk later on? If, we, if, if he or she eats it now, does, does, will she develop asthma? Will she develop other disorders? What is the long-term effect, etc.? So that's what we wanted to study in this, in this, uh, in this publication. Uh, so the, the research question was, if there is an increase in asthma prevalence, it's also that the um, prevalence of antibiotics has also increased. Is there a causal association? So we studied the association between early antibiotics during pregnancy or after birth and the risk of childhood asthma in, in school age. Uh, and we also wanted to know whether it was confounded by respiratory tract infections because, uh, of course, the association can be confounded by, reverse, by respiratory tract infection because the, the respiratory tract infection can affect uh, the asthma as well. Uh, and also whether the, uh, the association was confounded by genetic and environmental factors shared by family or shared within the family, shared by siblings. Um, and uh, to do this, we use these, these registers. So these are the, the registers that are available in Sweden, either from the National Board of Health and Welfare, Socialstyrelsen, or Statistics Sweden, Statistiska Statistiska Centralbyrån, SCB. And they, the registers can be linked through the personal ID number, the personal number. It can be linked. Um, we always get the data de-identified, so we don't see the person number. But we can see, we can, we can link the, the different separate uh, registers together and then study the association from early on during pregnancy or childhood and later disease. And the, um, the, the, ex the registers we often use are the multi through the multi-generation register, we can identify parents and siblings. So a child, we can identify the child's siblings and parents. We can also identify um, diagnosis from the National Patient Register and medication from the prescribed drug register. We can identify um, early measures of birth weight, gestational age, um, motor delivery, etc., from the medical birth register. And then we can link that to the outcomes 
so in this case asthma uh, disease from diagnosis or prescribed drugs and then we measure the association. In this picture there is also uh, the Swedish Twin Registry and the Born into Life and Stopper study that I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, what we also do in, these, in, 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 in the research group that I'm, where I'm active is we use something we call family design. So uh, the, 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 old, the usual way, the traditional way to measure an association is to look at differences between the families. Uh, so individuals from different families are compared. This child was, I, was uh, uh, treated with antibiotics, but not this one. Is there a difference in the risk of asthma? What we do in the, in the within family analysis is that we compare individuals within the same family. So siblings, twins, cousins, half-cousins, etc. And by doing that, we can adjust for all the potential confounders that are constant within the family, everything that they share. So, so genetics, for example, or, um, or diet, and other things that are available in the family, lifestyle and socioeconomic status, etc. So that's what we use a lot, this within family design. So in this study, we looked at the uh, exposure with antibiotics from the prescribed drug register, categorized on indication, all indications, and auto-treated uh, airway or urinary tract infections to account for the um, confounded by indication. Outcome was defined as asthma, uh, as a combination of asthma diagnosis and prescribed asthma drugs, and then we use a number of confounders. Uh, we use a whole cohort, so all children born from 2005 onwards, uh, first in the whole Swedish population and then the siblings, all siblings, all children that had siblings. We do, so we do one analysis in the big sample and one in the within, within siblings. And what we found is this is the uh, association between antibiotics in fetal life, that is during pregnancy and subsequent asthma. This is the whole cohort. There is an association. You have the odds ratio of about 1.2, 1.3, with very small confidence intervals. And when we, when we compare within siblings, the association completely disappears, which is a sign of that there is confounding within the family. And also, when we do analysis on the antibiotics in early life and childhood asthma, we also see that there is an association in the, both for airway and for urinary tract infections for the whole population. And within siblings, this disappears or almost disappears for the airway uh, antibiotics. So this is just one example of how we do these analyses. The conclusion for this study was that the association between antibiotics and asthma is mainly caused by confounding factors shared within, f shared within siblings or shared within families. Uh, and there is also confounded by indication for the, and reverse causation for the uh, uh, respiratory tract infections. Uh, and then when we do this, when we have this result, we write it up, of course, we publish, this, this paper was published in the BMJ, and then we go back to the clinics and we interact with the patients and parents and we say, they say, look, does antibiotics cause asthma? We say, no, it, it actually doesn't. Uh, there is no association. They're probably not a causal association between antibiotics and asthma. And of course, don't give antibiotics if you don't have to, because antibiotics, uh, there is a risk of, of uh, um, uh, res res uh, resistance development. And again, very importantly, treat asthma carefully and follow up and give advice and correct medications. And then again, this is the way that we go back and we get the new research questions from the parents. And these can be all sorts of causes, like birth weight, murder delivery, cats and dogs, tobacco smoking, comorbidity, etc but also consequences, and this is the other thing that we do. We can also study consequences of childhood disorders. In this case, it's asthma. What are the consequences of my child's asthma in the long run? What is the consequence of his or her medication? Again, we study this in the same way. We have the exposure this time. is the disease, the asthma, or the medication, the inhaled corticosteroids or whatever. And then we, we, they want to know uh, what are the outcomes in the long term. This is not just in five years, but you know, when they're 20 or 40, uh, are they more prone to, is there an effect on their growth? Is there an effect on their uh, social factors, education, etc.? So this is something that we really, uh, we, we, um, we study, and I think it's a really nice way that we can do it in the Swedish uh, patient uh, and um, uh, 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 population-based registers. Mm -hmm.
Uh, the third item I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is other, other translational research. Um, we've already talked a little bit about clinics, epidemiology and of course public health. I mean the, in the long run what we do with these research questions, we do, uh, we do uh, guidelines, we talk about, we write it and we give advice to the maternal um, and baby health clinics. But there are also research questions related to genes environment and of course biomarkers and biostatistics and bioinformatics. So these are the other two uh, study populations that we work with. Um, the, uh, f the first one here is the population-based register linkages, the causes and consequences, that's one. Uh, the second one is we work very much with the Swedish Twin Registry. And I think this is really inspirational. This was one of the reasons when I came back from my postdoc in Sydney, this was the reason I wanted to come to this department where I am, which is the Department of Medical Epidemiology and Biostatistics, where they have the, the, med uh, the, the Swedish Twin Registry. The Swedish Twin Registry consists of a lot of different cohorts from the, the earliest ones was bought with is, is, uh, people born in the late 1800s. Uh, but, uh, but, but it's, it's currently, they're currently um, still collecting data. The nice thing about studying twins is that monozygotic twins, MZ, they share 100% of genes. Whereas dizygotic twins, they share 50% of the segregating genes. They have the same environment often. They were brought up in the same environment. So uh, the only thing that differs is the genetics. Um, so we can study them through questionnaires, parental questionnaires or their own questionnaires and register-based linkages and also to invite them to clinical examinations. The third group that we're working with is birth cohorts, which is children that are born, f I mean uh, mothers and children that are born from pre-pregnancy to childhood to, uh, to study objective markers and biosamples and also physiological testing. Uh, one of the studies that we are currently have just recently uh, finished data collection is the, uh, the STOPA study, the Swedish twin study on prediction and prevention of asthma. Uh, it's a study uh, in 9 to 12, 9 to 14 year olds based on the childhood and adolescent twin study in Sweden. It was a telephone interview of approximately 26,000 children born from 1992 onwards. And from this group of children, we have identified children that were one child has asthma, but not the other one. So they're asthma discordant. And especially the monozygotic twins, where one child has developed asthma, but not the other one, there must be something. They have the same genes, but there must be something else, either in the environment or in the epigene or epigenome. Uh, so we are really interested in studying these children. We also studied dizygotic and we also include concordance. So children were both children of asthma or none of them of asthma. And we've been uh, uh, examining these children, approximately 750 children, um, clinical examinations with questionnaires, biomarkers and lung function. We travelled around Sweden with uh, our equipment and research nurses and PhD students. Uh, and we've been from Umeå to um, Lund and from Göteborg to Stockholm. Uh, developed, we've, uh, they've answered questionnaires, both the parents and the children. And we have uh, assessed biomarkers from blood, saliva, urinary and fecal samples. And also lung function, both spirometry uh, with reversibility testing, which is a way to measure the airflow in the airways. And also uh, exhaled NO, which is a measure of inflammation. And then we can analyze these, these measures with biostatistics and bioinformatics, DNA methylation, GWAS, saliva cortisol, and microbiota. These are ways to measure and to see is there a difference in the children that have or do not have asthma. Again, publications and presentations. And we also involved, involved lots of students, both medical students, PhD students, postdoc and senior researchers in this whole uh, in the whole process, also be being out there and, and examining the children. Um, the third group that we have, uh, the third research question we have is related to um, the early life, the very early life. There are lots of really, really good birth cohorts uh, throughout the world. Uh, and they've often started very early on uh, when the children have been born and they they um, follow them uh, closely throughout uh, their lifespan. What we've done in this study is we've, we've followed them already before birth. 
So we've, we've already, at the, at, at, uh, before the m mother becomes pregnant, we have collected data on questionnaires again, and biosamples, and physiological measures. Uh, and then we've followed them through pregnancy, in week 10 to 12, in week 26 to 28, at delivery, to collect uh, maternal and cold blood and placenta. And then we follow the children at six months, one, two, and five years of age. And what we want to do with this is to study pre-pregnancy markers for pregnancy and birth outcomes, uh, and also pregnancy markers for childhood disorders, as well as sort of longitudinal measures throughout pre-pregnancy to, uh, to childhood, to look at different disorders and to look at uh, changes in, for example, IG sensitization, which is a way to measure allergic disease, both in the mother, how does her, how does her allergic uh, status differ or change throughout pregnancy, but also when the child is born. Uh, we look at glucose metabolism, glucose, B-glucose and, and insulin and IGF-1, etc., to see how that, how that develops throughout, uh, throughout the pregnancy and in the little child, depending on his or her birth weight uh, and gestational age. So, so this is what we find, <laughs> what we find really inspirational. Uh, there is also uh, a, a lot of teaching and supervision, and I think this is uh, this is something that's really, really important uh, to do. And there are lots of opportunities today. Lots of you have, I think, maybe all the uh, programs have degree project works, ex jobs. So you need to do, uh, I guess, fifteen or thirty points. Um, of, of, uh, of, of X job and I think that's a really good way for you to get into research and see whether research is something for you or not. And even if you just do 30 points, um, EC, whatever it's called, it's, I think it's, it's a really good way to get this scientific feeling for, for, what, what your, um, for your clinical future work. So uh, what, we, what we do is we teach teach medical students uh, in, uh, in the, the medical um, ex-job, 30, uh, 30 grades on um, terms 7 and 8. These are the, the, the people I've had uh, for in our group, as two of them have also gone to become PhD students. I'm sorry, this slide is in English. It's in Swedish. We also have residents, so uh, uh, um, people that are doing their training in pediatrics. Uh, and some of them also go to be PhD students, and also uh, clinicians and others that do postdocs. So this is a really, really, really good um, group of people that I've been working with very closely. Uh, the last piece I just wanted to mention is also that, that knowledge transition is something that's important. It's important to be able to go out and talk about what you're doing and, and, to, and to sort of translate it into uh, into, um, into clinical, um, um, everyday sort of life and guidelines. Uh, what we do, one of the things that we do is to be involved in the, in the Medicine Skeletic STEM or the Swedish um, Royal Society of Medicine. We give a large conference every year in the end of December. And this is a really good opportunity to come out and to talk, both about your own research, but also about the things that are common for all medical doctors, not only, not only related to our own subjects and uh, for all researchers. I think this is a really good way. This, this year's theme is on tomorrow's um, healthcare uh, challenges and possibilities. There's also a lot of focus on this one on ethics and research and education and quality. So if you have the opportunity I think this is a really really good thing to go and see. Uh, there is also, and this is important, maybe not for you guys that are still students, but when you are finished and you start working, it's very important to keep, to keep doing your... Uh, uh, um, um, oh, what's that in English? Fortbildning. Um, anyway, to, to, to keep learning. I think that's very, very good. CPD, continued professional development, that's the word. And that's what they have in a lot of other countries. We haven't really developed that in Sweden for our uh, continuous professional development. But I think it's, keep that in mind, that it's a good thing to do. Oops, sorry. So uh, I just have a couple of more slides to say that I think that I've tried, what I've tried to show you is uh, the way that we hold on to our clinical research questions. 
We try to interact with patients and parents to get them answered. We take them back into, uh, into the, uh, we take them back into the lab, we research, we take them back into the, to, to tell the patients and parents what we find. And then we also try to not only do the epidemiology and clinical research with public health, but also go into the, to look at the actual genes and the environment. And to combine this to, be, to become translational research, I think is really inspiring. And, and we are very happy to have different skills in the group. And I think that's what you also have the opportunity to do when you are finished, or even now, that you try to find your own, uh, your own skills, but also to find other skills that you can combine with yours. Again, to do teaching and supervision and also knowledge transition. If I wanted to give you uh, just a few more words, I think a, a couple of advice. I think if you want to do if you want to do, um, if you want to combine research with your clinical, depending on your own program, that study program that you do, but the clinical that you, uh, pro pro program you're going to do, try to find novel research questions. Try to keep sort of tuned, stay tuned in the research area. What are, what are the really novel uh, bits and pieces? Uh, interact with peers. Try to find your good supervisors, co-supervisors, mentors, etc., and see if you can if you can develop what you want to do. Uh, translation, translation and research, develop your own skills but also contribute to other, others to, to, to show your own skills and to contribute to research. Collaborate and as I said stay tuned to the, uh, the novelty in the, your research area, uh, research and clinical area. And again teach and supervise and also communicate the findings. Um, that's my last uh, slide. I just wanted to give acknowledgement to all my patients and parents, of course, also students, postdoc colleagues and collaborators. A lot of funding, a lot of work, a lot of doing studies and research is on applying for funding and hopefully getting it. So I'd like to acknowledge all our funders and also, again, friends, mentors and my family. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much.